们的老啊，就是老朋友了。他来了我们每三年就来一次，可能我们 review 一下，每三年就来一次，<笑>专门给我们讲那个关于土地开发方面的项目。所以他张博士呢，就他自己公司有个设计公司，这所有的流程，他成 build house 啊，他的从头开始都可以帮我们的客户跟进。所以他的项目就大有小，很多项目都得做。啊，庄博士呢，也是我们他的头衔很多了，其中一个是我们家中啊啊加拿大家中投资总商会的副会长，和我们就在一起的。啊，他好多职务，有什么什么安倍通商会啦，加拿大通商会他们会长的职务很多了，所以他很忙。我们约的一个月前呢约好他，说过来再给我们大家说说，跟 custom b u i l d 好那个那个那个项目的流程。所以今天呢，我们很荣幸就最亲了他，希望他给我们。大家带来更多的啊，专、呃、业方面的啊、呃、知识，这样我们学了更多的东西。我们欢迎张博士。谢谢，谢谢。好，呃，谢谢。呃，其实我没有觉得好像三年前、三年以前才来过一次，我觉得好像没多久之前来过一次。所以这里面有些朋友我们都已经认识了，另外一些可能是一些新的那个。反正我跟 David 从办公室以后没多久就跟他在一起，在地产投资总商会。实际上我。嗯、um, ，不是很多的参加这种社会活动，但是我主要的是那个地产投资总商会比较多一些，因为我是安徽人，所以安徽的一些商会活动我们参加。还有一个比较大的呃组织是江苏国际商会，他们很活跃，所以我们主要我主要就参加这些。那么作为我个人呢，我是建筑师注册的建筑师，那么我在中国学的呃 bachelor 跟 master， 然后去德国学了。PhD， 然后九七年就移民到加拿大来了。那么这二十多年了，二十多年有十几年是在一个在两个大公司工作，一个地方工作了六七年，主要做各种各样的建筑设计。这个建筑师的项目大家都知道，他是加拿大当时是头号的那个建筑，他现在已经九十多岁退休了。那么他的成名作是 Eaton Center， 是实际上第一个 mall， 他是把一个。原来现有的房子中间做了一个 mall， 把它围起来了。那么再到后边做的是 q u i n s k y Terminal 的改建 ，Ontario Place 儿童医院，那个呃 Prince Margarina Hospital、Sunny Brook， 还有温哥华的那个展览中心，就上面几个帆船的都是他做的。所以当时跟他做很开心。他是个德国人，所以我在加拿大做的第一个项目是东柏林的项目。但是因为我是会说德语，懂得德国的这些建筑规范。那么，这个经历对我们很重要。那么，包括我太太当时也在那个地方工作，我们做了各种各样的。那么，比较晚的工作是 Niagara Falls Casino 跟这个 Trump Tower。那么，这些经历呢，给我们带来了很多的这些，呃，建设了很多大的项目，包括这些高层次的这种规划。那么后边六年的时候，实际上我在 Diamond Schmidt。这个公司主要是做校园的，一大半都是校园，在全球到处做校园，从幼儿园做到大学，那么多伦多大学、York University 都有他的项目。那么我在那里面实际上不是做建筑师，作为绿色绿色建筑专家的。那个时候，呃，加拿大绿色建筑刚刚起步，所以加拿大绿色建筑委员会成立的时候，我当时就是在他们 management 的 committee， 所以。实际上，在我开公司之前，我也参加很多这种社会的活动，但主要是社会的这些，呃，专业呃地方的工作。那么一二年正式运作我们自己的公司了。那么运作公司的时候呢，那个时候就是市场刚刚开始，呃，热起来，就一二年的时候，那么华人的社会刚刚开始。其实那个时候我们。其实我刚刚开始公司的一般的项目是从主流社会接的绿色建筑咨询项目，那么包括加拿大、美国、以色列的这些绿色建筑项目都有。那么后来这个房地产越来越热的时候，我们开始在华人社会里面接一些小型的项目，就是从翻建、改建、加建。但同时我们在主流社会还做一些这种大型的这种呃开发项目。其实我们公司成立。六个月的时候就得到了一个一千多单元的这个开发项目在 Brampton， 后来这项目停下来，但是我们一直在主流社会里做着。那么一千目前已经做完了的 Scarborough 两个大型项目，一个是两百五十单元的 Condo 加呃 
呃 commercial， 然后另外是山东这个二十四层的，那个在 Lawrence 那上面，所以实际上华人社会，我们公司华人社会的，人家的感觉跟在主流社会是两样的。那么不管怎么样吧，就是在成立以后，华人社会对我们公司的支持很大，因为华人社会开发的这个规模越来越大，所以现在。我们基本上一直是保持一半是华人社区的项目，一半是主流社会的。那么目前，我们头几年的时候可以说是三分之二都是小型项目。那么现在，这种住宅项目大概占我们四分之一不到的这个呃比例了。我们一般的项目是这种呃 ，townhouse 从十个单元到一百三百个单元这种。那么。我们一直保持有四五个，呃，大型的居住建筑。那么最新签的一个合同是在伦敦的一个项目，就是，呃，一百八十个单元的 condo。那么，所以我们是这样的一个过，呃，那个。然后，同时我们还继续做绿色建筑咨询和这个，呃，其他的商业建筑，包括 health care。所以我们公司虽然很少，呃，很小，现在十二个人。但是我们力量还是蛮大的，呃，我们现在有三个注册的建筑师，都是资深的，那么还有两个，其实第三个建筑师是在我们那里面成长出来的，他到我们公司来的时候才刚刚开始考试，然后在我们公司里面变成建筑师了，现在是我们的一个很重要的骨干力量。那么还有两个我们自己培养的，大概也在后边三到六个月也能完成。那么也就是说，我们十二个人里面有五个注册的建筑师。这种比例很大，那么因为今年的选举，使得我们很多这个申报的工作会推迟一段时间，所以到明年选举以后，我们很多这些开发项目就进入施工图阶段的时候，我们公司恐怕就会扩大到呃十五个人以上。那么我说的这些经历呢，实际上就代表着一会儿我们讲的这些内容，我们在这个实践中得到的一些经验跟大家交流。那么这个上一次我们来讲的时候，这个题目呢？是这个开发项目的申报的这个程序。那么这个题目后来改成风险管理是什么时候改的？不是上次去年四月份危机之之后改的，是在这之前，在一七年初和一六年年底的时候，因为我们在这个申报的第一线，我们是知道这个市场在软一个非非常不正常的状况。那么很多人在高价的时候买房的时候，买土地的时候，那时候买土地的原则是什么呢？我如果把这块土地买下来，然后今天就把开发完了，然后就把它卖掉，如果挣的钱是零，他就可以买。那么就意味着什么呢？我把这块土地买下来的时候，如果今天把它，比如说一百个 townhouse 也好，还是两百个 condo 也好，今天再把它卖掉，我是一分钱不挣的。但为什么能挣钱呢？因为这市场每年涨，所以我两年以后卖的时候，我可能就会占就挣百分之四十左右。那么我每年挣百分之二十已经是非常好的回报。那么就按照这种逻辑，在那个时候很多人在买地买地买地。那么就有人在那个时候买完地以后，发现第二年的时候再开发的时候，你到两年以后卖的价格恐怕跟现在也差不多，那么他就挣不到钱。挣不到钱以后呢，所以他们。就把它放慢了速度，放慢了速度。但是这种大型项目它 OK， 因为这整个的申请过程你稍微拖慢一点点就会多出一年时间出来，等着这个市场调整的时间过去。因为这次市场调整的一个最大的特点不是经济危机造成的，而是房地产市场本身的这个造成的。那么所以呢，现在大家对这个中长期的大家都有信心，所以现在呢仍然有人买。那么你可以想象。如果你今天去买一块地，跟去年这个时候买一块地，价格几乎是一样的，那么今年你买一块地的人，显然他信心会大很多，因为等到他做完的时候，那么市场调整的时间给了更多的一年的空间，所以他就会多出很多。那么，所以这是目前的这样一个状况。我知道你们是 A 君的，对你们的影响是利基的影响，但是对对开发商的影影响呢，那就看这个开发商的规模跟他的计划了。他如果计划很大，他规模很大，他慢慢内部调整就可以了。他有些项目可以提前，有的项目他可以拖后。那么对我们建筑师事务所，我们事务所算是比较 lucky 的
，基本上是在市场调整的时候，我们公司的结构调整了，所以，所以我们公司目前倒是发展的，呃，没有受到这个影响。我们知道市场在调整，知道我们的项目在调整，是呃，但是我们我们公司自己的运作倒是很好，呃，目前我们更 focus 一些这种大型的项目，那么。我们公司的呃这个地址大家都呃我在这里面已经有了，就在 Leslie 跟这个呃 York Mills 那个地方一个 Plaza， 我们在 Plaza 的南边有一个地方，呃， OK， 所以所以是从那个时候我们觉得这个市场很风险的时候，我们把它改成了这个讲座，就是这个风险控制一和二这两个我们今天都讲。那么第一，我们主要是讲在这个开发的过程中，你怎么哪些因素影响你这个开发的这个 performance 这个效果，然后你怎么分析和控制你这个风险。那么做所有的 business 都有风险，但是呢，风险是可以控制的。那么我们今天讲两个部分，一个是在规划、在购地和规划这个阶段，你怎么控制你的这个风险，你怎么提高你这个项目的利润率。那么还有一个在。建筑设计和这个施工的过程中，所以我们今天讲这两个方面的内容。那么，首先我们，哎，这两个都是一样的。呃、哦，刚才我们已经介绍了我们这个公司了，所以我们简单的说一下，就是我们公司是一个 full service architecture practice， 就从专业的描述就是这样，就是一个专一个可以提供所有服务的建筑师的。建筑师所有服务的一个公司，那么我们的分的里面，目前主要是规划这个阶段，然后这一阶段我们普通的建筑师一般呢是做 master plan， 就说在总图上面把这些房子在初步的设计布置上面，高层、低层、地下室这些东西，那么这是普通的建筑师一般的做的这个呃内容，但是呢，我们公司还有一个特点就是可以做这个 application management。那么，通常这一部分百分之七十五以上是 planner 做的，然后建筑师是通过做 master plan 跟 planner 一起呃合作，然后其他的一些专业的呢，他一般的都不 touch 这个 overall 的东西，因为建筑师是什么都管。然后这里面一会儿我们还会介绍，他有很多专家，比如说交通、水呃水的供给和排水，然后。呃，地址，呃，环境，他们呢一般都不会 manage 一个 overall 的项目，他们只做他的那一个具体的东西。所以 management 一般呢是 planner 跟建筑师一起做。那么我们有很多项目是中国的客户，那么他来了以后呢，往往是在前面这个阶段的时候，都是我带他把这个初步的设计市场，呃，那个市政府的一些规划要求的调查完了以后，才。雇了建筑呃规划师，那么他来的时候，基本上等到他进来以后，我们跟他设了大概一般一般的这个管理的这个工作。那么一会儿我们还会讲这个过程的时候，大家就更理解，在这个阶段，建筑师和规划师是做些什么事。然后还有就是普通的建筑设计，就是规划做完以后，那么规划师也撤了，这个队伍里面的几乎所有的人都撤掉了以后，那么建筑师再找后边的结构工程师和设备电器工程师完成建筑的设计和他的申报。那么这是建筑师的传统上的这个工作。那么我们公司也有一个 interior design 这个部分。那么我们一个专门的 interior designer 是一个德国人。那么，呃，我们做豪宅跟这个那个呃商业建筑的所有的这个室内设计。那么一会儿我们再介绍这一块。然后就是 construction management， 呃，跟这个 administration。那么这个翻译的时候都是管理，但是呢，实际上 administration 是指 building code 规定的建筑师必须做的这个管理，就是你设计完了，在安大略省，你在报 building permit 的时候，建筑师必须 sign 一个 of 呃一个 form， 就说 commitment to general review， 也就是说在施工的过程中，他的这个施工的质量是不是符合 building code， 是不是符合设计的要求，建筑师必须做的。那么在这个过程中，如果这个建筑师因因为种种原因自己退出来，或者是甲方不喜欢把它给 fire 掉了以后，那么你这个施工许可就暂时 hold 了，直到你找到下一个建筑师进来。所以建筑师在这一块有很多呢
那么 management 呢，我们有时候做，有时候不做。那么主要就是说 manager 他的 schedule、他的 price、cost 的所有的这些东西。那么这个实际上是，呃，但是我们公司也做，我们公司就是每一年做几个项目这种。还有就是绿色建筑，实际上是我们个人的本行，因为我在德国是学的是节能建筑，然后到了加拿大以后，一直跟加拿大绿色建筑界就是比较联系比较多。那么到二零。一一年我退出那个公司的时候，我 manage 了三十多个 lead 的项目。那个时候我估计在多在加拿大只有很少的建筑师能做到这一点。那么，但是在加拿大绿色建筑委员会里面，我是唯一的这个建筑师出身的专家，所以在那里面我们加拿大很多绿色建筑的这些，呃，实施的这些指导书纲领都是我们当时编出来的。所以在这一块呢，我们当时影响很大。还有一个这上面我们没提到的，实际上我。在那个公司做六年的时候，我五年是做这个医院的，所以医院实际上是我们公司的一个长项。那么自从我自己搬到公司以后，就再也没有做过，除了一些小的这种 clinic。但最近我们跟一个很大的这个私人医院合作，我们现在又开始做这一部分。所以我们公司其实做的一些都是比较，呃，难度比较大的这种项目比较多。那么这也使得我们公司对普通的市场的反应不是很敏感。所以这是我们的一个特点。那么这是我们公司成立的签的第一个合同，呃，在 North York 四十尺乘一百一十尺的地，然后做了一个两千五百左右的这个呃新型的新的住宅。那么这是我们做的第一个项目。然后第二年呢，我们做了这个改建的项目。这个项目当时很红的，它当时就是一个一层的房子，我们给它加了二层，然后里面做了一个全现代普爱的那个。在维克托亚的西边，分区的南边，那一块当时，这个公这个区的新的房子就卖到一百三十到一百五十万，但是我们改建完以后卖了一百七十万，所以我们做的时候，他人家都认为你肯定要那要做不好这些项目，因为我们做完了以后成本就是那么多钱，肯定是要赔的。但是等到我们开发的时候，每天两百个人去参观，我们开发了两个星期四天。然后就把它卖掉了。那么很长时间，这个房子是那最贵的一个房子。Okay, yeah,、uh, we can switch to English. <laughs> Now we are uh, uh, introducing the projects we have done. The first one of our firm is the new uh, semi-detached, uh, no, detached single-family house in North York. That is another project. Actually, is addition. We convert a one-story bungalow house to two-story modern-style uh, contemporary uh, house. Uh, that did a really a good job and then sold after two weeks. And that is our first townhouse. And actually, the project was not townhouse. Uh, we'll talk about that one later. And that is our first finished condominium uh, building in uh, in Scarborough. So here is facing the Lake uh, Ontario, and then another side is um, Kingston uh, Kingston Road, uh, 250 condominium units with a uh, commercial building. Uh, commercial spaces along the street, and uh, this one is the first uh, planning project. That is a winery with an uh, existing building here. We add new uh, winery, expand the winery part. At the same time, we add a club and a, a cottage here. That is not far from the Niagara Falls. If you drive, that is the last piece of land of the edge of town, Niagara Falls. And then, uh, on another side is another small town. And then if you drive along this street directly in like 10 minutes, you are going to be uh, in the Niagara Falls. So that is a hotel in Pickering. We actually we finished the schematic design five years ago, and then this 
whole area, uh, the plan was appeared, it's approved by the uh, city of Pickery, but appeared by uh, Ajax. And that is a part of a big development there, including the new casino. So it was already uh, finished, approved by the OMB. So that is the, the first project uh, we won by competition. We, uh, that is the, about uh, 1,200 uh, residential units plus uh, three-story uh, office and uh, retail space in Brampton. So, yeah, that is the uh, first townhouse. Actually, when we started that project, it was at the stage to improve, uh, to approve the site plan approval. So the original, so the or, that is not original, but the original design is a, a condominium apartment building with uh, no, all three are condominium apartments. And then the previous owner realized that in Cambridge, the market is not really good for so many units, about 200 units. And then we discussed it with the planning department, <coughs> saying that we want to change any density and the layout of the site, but we convert the apartment building, this one and this one, to stack townhouse with the same building area, same footprint, same height, same number of units, but uh, convert to townhouse. And they said, if you can do that, we will not let you to uh, redo the applications. You can finish the application to be approved, and then you can start the building permit application. And then we finish this one first, and this one is already occupied, and this one uh, is ready to start construction, but they decide to con start construction after this winter because of the market. So that is a, a house I like to show you the style because we started in Germany. We are very, very familiar with the contemporary style, modern and postmodern and deconstruction. And that is our own house uh, we're living here. It used to be called a one and a half story single family house. And then we removed the second story and the roof and then we did some addition and convert to a modern style uh, house. And the inside, that is there. And then here's added like a one and a half story uh, solar room. And you can see we use uh, wood and glass everywhere in the, uh, in the building. That is uh, the looking to the rear yard with a big deck. And that is the um, kitchen. So because that's our own house, we can do whatever we like. <laughs> <laughs> and many people visited there and they say, I like the kitchen and all I like the sunroom. And then have that in our house, we did a lot of that. And we also do, have done a couple of industrial buildings. That is the largest project that we have done. That's 40,000 square meters. And uh, this is a uh, lay, um, no, gaily. This uh, mark, you can uh, see it quite often in, the, in Loblos. They are uh, diary uh, production, very big. So the whole building, Actually, like a cooler, so the, the, they, are, they do not do production here, but they uh, uh, distribute all the products here. They, they have many different uh, shops. Where is this place? Is this 
No, in uh, Ethiopia. Yeah. No, no, no. The, in the industrial part, in the west, uh, northwest corner of 400 and uh, 401, there big industrial area. Yeah. But the interesting is that this project we we signed a very good contract. We finished the schematic design. And the city said we were supported to go through the site plan approval because that will create more than 100 uh, jobs. But suddenly it stopped because they realized that this uh, soil cannot support the heavy building. And um, it's not uh, finally uh, dead yet, but uh, it uh, does not seem to resume very quickly. But that is very uh, interesting in building. Okay. Yeah, as I said, we also do uh, need project management, need means uh, leadership in environment, uh, in energy and environmental design. That is a green building rating system started from the U.S. G, uh, GBA, uh, GBC, U.S. Green Building Council, and adopted by uh, Canadian. Uh, Green Building Council. So that is the first one I did, not in this firm, but in another firm, uh, the Royal Botanical Gardens that need uh, certified with gold. And that is the inside the opening uh, ceremony. And uh, that is a private school, the two buildings uh, on the same uh, school campus in Pittsburgh. Uh, actually, this one we finished when, uh, by uh, my own firm. We started uh, with the firm where I was working for, and but finished by us. So that is the gymnasium uh, house. That is a very uh, good private school. Uh, Prince Harris were studying here. This is their students. And that is the Banff Center uh, we finished just years ago. Uh, it's also a education building. And then um, University of Windsor, the medical center. And then the last one we finished, uh, the lead project uh, is the law school at uh, York University. Uh, now we have still three lead projects ongoing. So that I just show our firm's uh, history and uh, what we are doing. And for, as we have already mentioned, for construction or development projects, the key is, uh, or your goal is to make profit. And actually, more important is for you to manage and control your risk. So that is a very important uh, scissor uh, diagram. So this line shows uh, your investment, your money. At the beginning, you haven't uh, have any money. And then you decide to buy the lot and then do the design and then do construction. So your, the money you invest to the project from zero to 100. But the ability for you to control your costs, you started at the beginning 100%. And then once the, start, the project runs forward, the ability you can control is dropped. So even you start doing a renovation of your basement, you may have the experience. Before you start, you can look for different contract, different design and the building permit application, you spend a couple of thousands, you can finish this part. And then once you start, you finish the construct, your design, you spend about 10% or 15% money. And then you start construction. From there, your ability to control is dropped about half. And then once you contract your project to somebody, you can feel that uh, actually 
how well you can do is depending who is doing your job. So that is that what we try to understand is that uh, starting a project is very important. Yeah. So what is a risk? So risk means something is uncertain of a project. And uh, so each project has different risk. If you feel you don't have risk, that means you have risk already because you don't know what will happen. If you know the risk, that's good. That means you understand the risk is associated with the project. And then you can measure the, the risk. So like when you have a cost is estimate for construction, you know at least you put 10% money on site because anything can happen. So good thing is that risk is measurable and it can also be priced. So you know the risk, how much it will cost you. And then more important, the risk is manageable and controllable. So we live in, uh, in the society like today, actually everybody facing kind of risk every day. Like when you're driving, when you are uh, do your work always some risks, but you know how to manage it, including put some insurance there or put some uh, available uh, fund there to react to something that could happen. That is the same thing for a development. So when you start a project, you always look at if anything is uncertain. Like when you decide to buy a lot, you need to understand the planning requirements, about including including current zoning bylaw, official plan, environments protection re regulations, and also soil and everything. You you need to, and also the site condition, like if there is any contamination and any flooding and uh, <coughs> geotechnical or hydrogeotechnical issues. And also, if any requirements, like uh, you are just beside a uh, wetland or a forestry that need to be protected because of the plants, because of the animal in that area, and infrastructure, even in Toronto, you say your project is just beside a very dense, uh, already established area, but uh, the current service may not have the capacity for your project. That means the drainage maybe is not enough. And, uh, and uh, to increase the capacity, you need to spend a lot of money. All the capacity is okay, it's just the service is uh, uh, 50 meters away from your lot. And then you need to extend that service to your lot. And the city does not want to spend any money. So whenever you need or whoever want to develop that land, they say, okay, the service is just 50 meters away. You can extend it. You can ext spend your money. And that is the kind of the cost you need to understand. And sometimes there's a road needs to be extended. And, and also kind of soft risk, like uh, relation to the neighborhood. So some neighborhood looks so beautiful, but uh, for good or for not good is uh, that area is a cultural heritage area. So many people bought a lot very nice in a uh, very nice area in uh, like uh, Richmond here, they ask us to do a design. He really like, uh, um, he chose us because uh, he know we can do modern style uh, house. But when we went to the city, the city know, because you are located in a cultural heritage community, your style must match the existing one. You could have a kind of a contemporary style 
but your height, your setback, and uh, other form need to match it. And uh, after all, we did a good job. They, they are living there. They are very happy with that. But that is, a, that is okay for the single family house to be used by the, uh, the owner's family. But if you do a larger scale the design, it could cost you quite much. So that is also a kind of risk. And uh, so most important is you need to understand when you buy a lot and then what is your goal, what you like to do, and then what you do if it is possible or what is a uh, conflict with the environmental issue, the natural issue, and the cultural issue, and the, the planning, uh, everything. So that is a, when we buy a lot, just don't just look at the lot size and how beautiful it is, and but look at the other issues. Yeah. So uh, for the planning issues, usually you re, uh, a project related to those regulations, like a provincial policy. Uh, each four years, Ontario government issue a provincial policy statement, that gave all the municipalities the guideline about their official plan and the, the zoning uh, bylaw uh, changes. And then another very important thing is the zoning bylaws. So each town, each city has a zoning bylaw or bylaws. So sometimes, like Markham, they have 42 bylaws. And Toronto has, a, like, a, before they have 50 or more, 100 bylaws. They try to combine them to one bylaw, but that bylaw is approved by the city council, but it's approved, uh, appeared in uh, 2013. It's still under review by the OMB. And the official plan is very important because uh, in most case, when we do a development, we may ch need to change the zoning bylaw. Official plan is re reviewed each five years by the municipalities. For the small towns, they review the whole. But the Toronto take another approach because it is too big, too complicated. They review area by area. So each year they update or revise the zoning, uh, the official plan for some areas. That is very complicated, by the way. Uh, sometimes we need the help f uh, from lawyers to understand uh, the legal uh, effect of the revised uh, zoning bylaw and official plan. And the environmental protection regulations uh, in Ontario, is, they have a very special organization, it's the conservation authorities. So Ontario has totally 36 uh, authorities. Those authorities is an agency of the provincial government, but it's not part of the government. They are very independent. The government can influence them only by changing the environmental conservation law. So they are very independent. And then many of our projects, we need to go to like TRC, that means uh, Toronto and the Regional Conservation Authority. And the Lake Simcoe uh, has also uh, authority, and the Niagara Falls, uh, 2036. So they have a very strong power to influence your building, uh, your projects, if your project is located within their regulation area. And then each city, like especially in Toronto, because Toronto is very dynamic, they uh, quite often issue design guidelines. That give you some guidelines for future development, like uh, in uh, Bayview, south of uh, 401, that area you can see one and one, uh, one by one, many 
new uh, townhouses uh, are uh, built, but there is no secondary uh, plan or official plan guiding that. And that's because to have an official plan be approved is uh, last very long, at least two years or even more. And then the city uh, may issue a guidelines that can also be approved by the council, but that is not a legal uh, document. That just reflects uh, the staff and the council's opinions. So that is very uh, useful for developers to communicate with the city staff and the council because that shows you their opinion. But that is a very tricky legal document because it is not a law yet. So yeah, the developer's uh, planner or lawyer can challenge it, say you approved, you issued this guideline, but that against the official plan. Because we had a project, we have a project still dealing with that. That does not comply with the guidelines, but it complies with the official plan. We'll say your guideline doesn't work for this one. That is the law. Once we we can comply with the official plan, you should approve. And then they say, okay, anyway, you need to change the zoning bylaw. But uh, our opinion is already explained or presented to you with the uh, uh, guidelines. So now. If you ask me, I say no. I, I understand. We don't. You don't need to amend the uh, official plan, but we will not agree support your zoning bylaw amendment. And then we will go to the next level. Why you don't support? And then they will say because of something. Okay, then we can do something so that you can support. So that's the way you communicate with the city. That can last very long, very complicated process. And then you need to talk to the staff, the staff agreed, and then you talk to the counselor. The counselor may say, I don't know, I need to consult with my uh, voters. And then they may uh, do a public meeting, and then let all the neighbors have an uh, opportunity to say. And that is the way we are managing the planning issue. And um, the provincial level, as, as I said, they always have a provincial policy statement. And, and most important is the Ontario Planning Act. And the last, and the, yeah, that is for the conservation authorities. A lot of acts. And then last year, the government removed the Ontario Municipal Board. And they did not change the planning act. So that means if something is approved or refused by the council, you can still appear as per the planning act, but no OMB anymore. You need to appear at the local court. They have a professional uh, court for this part only. But nobody knows what will happen. <laughs> because uh, some... Yeah. We, we have already some project that is already appeared. But uh, because the lawyer and the, the, the new uh, attribution uh, body does not know how to deal with it, we, we are still talking about that. And then uh, that is the things we are facing. And then the bylaw. So that's a typical bylaw. That's a North Circle bylaw. That this one is still uh, effective because the new bylaw is still under appealing. And that is an old uh, North York official plan. So many years ago, before the uh, city be combined the, four, uh, the six city to one city of Toronto. And I, what I like to say is at that time, North York official plan has uh, like a uh, over thousands of pages. And now that Toronto overall official plan about only 100 pages. And why? Because it's too big to have one single official plan. So now that Toronto's official plan, I didn't bring it today, it's very thin. 
but they have uh, 24 secondary plan for each for different area and then they still add and uh, change those uh, planning documents and then we uh, I'm not intended to uh, tell you all the detail but uh, you you uh, have a feeling what you are dealing with you are dealing with uh, a lot of regulations all of them are legal documents so you need your planner scale for to understand the intents and the requirements of all the documents you sometimes need the lawyer help you to interpret the uh, the laws sometimes the city have a notice saying you that you haven't complied with those regulations because of something and then the lawyer said no your interpretation is not correct actually you need to read it in this way so a lot of things to do so that's the reason architects somehow become <laughs> a half of lawyer that is a Toronto uh, Toronto has a official plan plus secondary plans all the colored one are secondary plans so they have a different secondary plan for different parts they can change it and uh, you can also modify it by amendment uh, application and then that is the way how the Toronto city of Toronto deal with the planning issues so and then in other cities like uh, Markham they have a uh, official plan one official plan covers everything so that is their newest uh, official plan I think it's the uh, 2014 or 16 uh, like they have many maps like this map shows uh, the land use like uh, residential commercial <coughs> and uh, industrial and uh, open space for environmental protection and here's uh, agriculture or something like that yeah this is a question let's say if you don't have to change land use you're still residential to a residential yeah before it's a bungalow now it's bigger it's result square footage yeah do you still have to go through amendment yeah it's a good question so uh, I can say from smallest one if you tear down a house and build a new house, that house complying with the uh, zoning bylaw, okay. and then in uh, ninety percent, once you meet the um, zoning bylaw, you meet the requirement of official plan. But in a few cases, the official plan has already been changed, but the zoning bylaw has not been changed. But anyway, once you comply with the zoning bylaw, no matter Com complying with the official plan a lot you can directly go through the uh, building permit application that is typical for a single family house but if you have a small change like the height they uh, permit the 10 meters but you propose 10.5 meters that's called minor variance application and then each city has a um, committee of adjustment right. and Toronto has four one in Toronto North York Scarborough and Etopical and then they can deal with the small change it's called a minor variance application that's also for severance right if you want severance. yeah the committee of adjustment uh, can do two things actually three one is minor variance mm -hmm. and another severance mm -hmm. but the severance only severance maximum to three lots more than three laws is subdivision you need to go to the um, sub, uh, the council but sometimes the city will tell you the city told me if you want to divide to four you can do twice <laughs> <laughs> you can divide to two and finish it and then divide do another, another two and save your money and time and also save their headache because the staff Sometimes you feel the staff always give you trouble, but actually the staff is working uh, with you together to get your project moving on. So that's your question very good. So that's a small one. And then the third way uh, the committee can deal with the easement. So if you need a uh, water uh, pipe to uh, run through another property, you can do that. And that's a small thing. But uh, they may 
refuse you if they feel that the change is not minor or does not meet the uh, intention of the zoning bylaw or official plan or they believe that is not good, desirable for the neighborhood. So the first three is easy, but the fourth one is very complicated. We had a various application refused just because the whole, law, uh, whole street, no integral parking uh, garage. All the garage, all the house is a no garage or garage in the rear yard. And uh, no zoning bylaw uh, say you cannot have a garage combined with your house. But the, all the neighbors say that we don't like it. <laughs> and, uh, and then the committee refused. Refused the reason because you change the character of the neighbor, neighborhood. And then, uh, and then they, uh, and I say, we are living in Toronto. You know how cold the winter is. So integral parking is very useful and comfortable for the residents. But they said, you know what, we need to keep the character of the neighborhood. That is the last one in Toronto, downtown, uh, with a small house without a garage in the front, uh, front elevation. And we, that is the last low income single family house neighborhood in Toronto. We need to keep it. So we were refused. And then we went to the um, OMB. We won the appeal. And in that area, it's OK. We have first one. I guess next one is much easier. But what's up, what uh, surprised me is in another seminal one, in, um, uh, well, I forgot the neighbor's, neighborhood's name. The neighbor pushed the councillor uh, had an amendment to the zoning bylaw for the whole area to uh, block any integral garage. So that is some funny thing. But uh, that's OK. We are living in this uh, law system. Everybody needs to uh, express their opinion. Once the council feels this, uh, Opinion sounds more uh, reasonable, they will approve. And then you can fight back to change it again. But uh, this is the way we are doing the job. So for the neighborhood approved, do you have all of them approved? Or there's no. like a percentage? Uh, no percentage, not necessary to be all. It's uh, depending on the uh, guys sitting in the community. And they vote. And then even only one say, I don't like and then the committee members say, I, I agree with him, they can refuse. Oh, okay. And then sometimes many people are there, like in Mark, Markham, you, one time when I was have a hearing, the uh, councillor bring like, uh, oh, more than 10 neighbors to be mm -hmm. there. And then the committee said, uh, uh, I thank you, but uh, we, we are not intended to agree with you, so I, I still approve. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter. But uh, of course, the people present you at least have the uh, capability to or ability to express your uh, argument correctly. Yeah, that's very interesting. Each city, like uh, North York, um, they have a hearing each second a week, so you guys can be there and listen, and then like. Uh, uh, 30th, I have another hearing in North York, so you can uh, listen. People just went there, uh, go to there, and uh, uh, speak what uh, they want, and then uh, they will hope. So that is for smallest projects directly go to building permit application, but the application is still reviewed for building code and zoning. And um, uh, that is the smallest thing. But not every project like this, you can do that. Like in Misaga, 75% of their area is uh, indicated as site plan control area. And then Richmond Hill has also many. That's because of the neighborhoods to be protected or because of uh, environmental issues. Like uh, 
last week I finished a hearing in Stouffville. Very interesting is that area is in the environmental area. That prohibit any building except the accessory building, like for farming or anything. But our client has a residence there. They want to have an addition, but no addition is allowed. So, and then you need to go through the uh, variance application. The variance application said uh, uh, the, the property is located in the environmental area that prohibits a, a mm. residential addition. And the uh, um, residential addition is proposed and then get the approval. And then when I went there, I said, usually I'm here because uh, our proposed building is too big, uh, too close to the property, or too high. But today, everything compliant with the zoning bylaw, only because of this, and then we get approval. So that is another thing. And then the same building, because of the same reason, need to go through the site plan approval. So, so you, you don't know. So that's the reason. When some people call me and say, I'm doing a new house to replace the old one, can you give me a price? I say, of course I can do that. And can you do it now <laughs> over phone? I say, no, because I don't know how much I need to do. Uh, it looks simple, but actually we may go through all the applications. So that, that's very interesting. It's not happen very often, but quite often. And uh, uh, yeah, that is the uh, documents we need. If we have a, uh, contamination, we need to do uh, environmental site assessment, phase one and phase two. And then that is a very important thing. Sometimes you may miss this, like uh, last time when uh, clients buy an uh, industrial building mm -hmm. and realize there is a, a dry cleaning before. In the dry cleaning, that I learned a lot from there. They have something in the um, soil that cannot be, uh, yeah, and then that could be a big problem. And the flooding, sometimes you need a TRC permit, and then geotechnical issues like the industrial building, everything is fine, but uh, because of the soil cannot support the heavy uh, building. So uh, one important thing is the Oak Region Marines, uh, Region Marine. That is a very interesting uh, geotechnical area. And they, here is a flat, here is another. The two came together and they, uh, created a very diversified uh, geotechnical and uh, bio uh, system. So there are many uh, endangered uh, animals uh, and um, uh, uh, plants there. So that is the Oak Region's Mary, this area. So that is very important uh, protection, uh, natural protection area. So once you are in that uh, environmental sensitive area, you need to have a study to look at the impact of your project, uh, your development on the uh, natural heritage and uh, uh, storm water management and uh, uh, geotechnical stability. Like if you, uh, your lot is uh, have a big slope. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's uh, Kingston. That is a, a small project in Pickering, and it looks very good. And the city likes to have a high density along the Kingston Road. And then uh, we had two projects here. Here's a, a retirement uh, um, residence. And the city said that here you can uh, build uh, any height, like 8, 10, you know, whatever you like. But then that's the uh, TRC said you cannot do anything because uh, the protection area, the lines here, 
and then from here you need to set back 10 meters and then go to here. Mm -hmm. And then after all, we, this project have been dealt with by the planner and the environmental guys for two years. And now finally they agreed to uh, reduce this uh, uh, buffer area from 10 meters to 3 meters. The, when, when they buy the lot, it looks beautiful. The two lots that's the frontage, the, the depth is go to here. And uh, they, when they bought it, they, uh, <laughs> they thought it's very nice. They said that we can have a, a small park here, they can have a bridge here, and it's beautiful. <laughs> but actually, you cannot do it. Even you have a deck within this area, it's not allowed. So, but the TRC is also changing there policies like for especially for uh, flooding management and then once you can create enough uh, space for flooding you can extend your uh, it's called the limit of development and the uh, other things as I said the city's servicing system and then it's typically happened like in a small town like a, a Stouffville some people buy both the lot many years ago, and the city tell them the drainage system will not be available until uh, 2020, and then you need to wait. And uh, in some cases, they say we can spend some money, and the city said if we want spend spend so much money, we can accelerate it uh, faster. Yeah, and then, but uh, sometimes that can surprise you when you your lot is uh, in Toronto. Like we have a um, cemetery building on uh, Birch Mount, and then just the, on, on another side of the street is a, a mall, and then uh, beside the uh, golf course, when we apply for building permit and uh, apply for a septic, and the city say, "Are you sure you need a septic? It's so close." And then I said, uh, I was surprised, but I'm sure we need it. And then because if you extend the service from there to there, you need to spend like a half a million. And then we decided to use a septic. So, and another thing is in Downforce, um, church, both the land and the convert retail to a church. And then they realized that there's no uh, storm water drainage system in that area. So th that can happen anywhere. And the transportation is very interesting. For small town, it's a big issue. And for Toronto, small area could be a big issue. But in downtown Toronto, it's not an issue. Because uh, last time when we have a, a townhouse on Bayview, the neighbors said that you are at 26 uh, new uh, residents, uh, the residential units here, and then you are in, uh, uh, increase more cars. And the council said uh, each day the Bayview, mm -hmm. 10, 20,000 uh, cars. You don't mind to add another 20. It's the same. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the study many years shows that uh, in downtown Toronto, has, uh, there's no way to improve the uh, traffic for people to drive there. The only way is to have uh, uh, to have trouble around the Toronto, so that the people cannot drive into the Toronto uh, area. So that sometimes that is interesting. And then in this case, we usually don't need to do transportation studies. We only do the study of the parking, how to make the parking uh, works. But the number of the parking is the same thing. For the small town outside of Toronto, you need to provide a parking space for each unit. The rate can be 1.2, 1.5, or 1.9. But in Toronto, you can do zero, because uh, uh, the city have two policies actually conflict each other. One, way, uh, one side, they encourage transit and walking and bicycle. Another thing is that in, they encourage you to provide enough uh, parking space. So that is the way we always argue with them. 
like first condominium town hall, uh, condominium apartment high rise with zero parking is the uh, in Young Street, Young and then, uh, College or somewhere. So there is no parking, and uh, that is indeed the project because uh, it said that they reduce the. Uh, they eliminated any parking space means encourage people to take a subway. <laughs> so that is the way you, anything you can dip, interpret it in different way. And the fire protection in Toronto is not a big issue. Sometimes uh, they may ask you to add a, a, a fire hydrant, but in uh, off the site, there is sometimes they need, because there is no water supply you need to have something to have uh, uh, fire protection water available. And the waste management is usually the big issue anywhere because uh, uh, you have a condominium, you need uh, uh, the waste put together and uh, the truck is big to uh, run in and out. And then, but the most uh, biggest problem we had is the uh, waste management in uh, Richmond here and um, uh, Markham because their truck, they, their rule is their truck cannot back in because the back in is dangerous. You have to, the truck needs to go in and uh, out and uh, turn out. Mm -hmm. And for a small lot, if they turn in this way, you, you have no space to do any building. So cultural heritage, I, as I said, and sometimes some individual building is a, a heritage building, mm -hmm. but it's called heritage building, there are different levels. So one, the highest level is a dedicated heritage building. Now, because the building was designed in a style many years ago and have a cultural value to protect, it, or because somebody was living there, like, a, a general uh, uh, governor may be living there, and then the building become heritage. And uh, sometimes a whole neighborhood is a heritage culture. And then in this neighborhood, then that uh, doesn't mean your building cannot be removed. Some of the building needs to be remain, others can be removed. But the new building needs to be designed in a way to match the existing style. And uh, that is a very difficult uh, uh, definition for us to explain neighborhood uh, characters or styles. And some, so that's, that is a, a lot of things uh, to be done by architect. You need to explain what is the style and how your style looks different but much the uh, neighbor's style. Like in downtown Toronto, we had uh, uh, students uh, residence, and then they said that you need to match the character of the neighborhood. And then we look at the map. There are many buildings built uh, uh, in different time with different style. And then we explain, so the new building is built in, will be built in 2019. So that building needs to match 2020 style to match the neighborhood style. Because that neighborhood is a dynamic uh, neighborhood. Each building reflects uh, the style when the building was built. So now what we need to build, we need to show the new style. So that is one of the interpretation. The city accepts the, uh, the argument. And uh, everything looks so complicated, but what you can do? And, uh, Good thing is, uh, in uh, North, North America, there is a very uh, established uh, uh, and not high-priced uh, high professional service. You need to follow the professional process and uh, use the resources available. So uh, the applications, as actually we have already uh, touched all of the things, you may need to amend the official plan, zoning bylaw, and usually you have to finish the site plan approval. So except the single family house for industrial or commercial building, 
for the addition and the new building, even you don't change any uh, official plan and zoning bylaw, you still need to go through the site plan approval. That will make sure the city have an opportunity to look at uh, the environmental servicing and the traffic, everything. So, and the subdivision and the condominium application, that is very much like a legal application. Uh, your lawyer can do that. And uh, about the, your question, the Committee of Adjustment is a very important uh, uh, body for your project. Once your application is small enough, you can go to there. And that will be circulated in four weeks to different departments and your neighbors before the hearing. And then the hearing where in the hearing, uh, the applicant can have five minutes to explain your uh, application. And then each neighbor or anybody who has opinion have five minutes to uh, have a speech. And then the applicant has another five minutes to respond to the uh, uh, opinions. That's very important for us. So, and then the committee member can discuss, can ask questions to anybody, and then make the decision. So that process is very good for us. Because uh, I, I did uh, hundreds uh, of applications, and then I realized, uh, first, I'm professional. The neighbors usually is not very professional. And secondly, is, uh, uh, I have tried two times to speak. So I may just uh, very uh, generally describe the application and then leave the questions uh, when the neighbors finished. Because when they finished, they were not allowed to speak again unless the committee, to, uh, the committee asked their question. And uh, another rule is very important is uh, only the committee member can ask questions. So if your neighbor asks your question, you don't need to answer. <laughs> and then they can only ans ask the committee member. The committee member may ask you. So this process is very important for us to understand. And uh, for some new applicants, they sometimes discuss with the neighbors. You just waste their time. You, you don't need to. And then sometimes the neighbors say something is not uh, reasonable. You can say that is not related to zoning bylaw. I don't want to respond. And then in this case, you can save your time and more focus on what you applied. Like some people said, uh, uh, my house is a one story. My left side is already a two story building. You have another two story. <coughs> my house is sandwiched in the middle. I feel uncomfortable. That is what <laughs> the Chinese neighbor told me uh, last year. And then the city said, uh, they have no variance about the building height. They have uh, the right to build a two-story building with this height. So it's done. That's yeah. <laughs> so uh, to finish the first part, uh, as I said, very important is to use your resources. And here, I. Uh, I uh, say there's two resources for us very important. One is the government. So when try to select a land for a development, <coughs> you can go to the planning, building, engineering department. But usually you start with the building department. Why? Because uh, the zoning bylaw is, uh, uh, is established by the planning department, but the building department has the right to interpret it. So usually you go to the building department to check the current zoning, what is the means, uh, what that means. And then go back to the uh, planning department, say the current zoning is this, but I'm doing this. And uh, we are going to rezone it, but I like to know the, site plan, the, plan, the official plan intents. And then you are get the idea and in some cases, you need to go to those uh, departments to know more. And in this part, you can use the government resource. And for uh, site plan applications, there are a lot of applications. In this case, 
actually you can hire your planner, your architects, your engineer to deal with this. But uh, when you buy it, you can still get information from the department. And uh, when the planning is approved, <coughs> and then you do walk-in drawing and uh, apply for a building permit. And the building permit is finished, you can start the construction. So you always work with different uh, municipal department and provincial agencies. So very important for some of your clients, they are from mainland China. They sometimes do not understand that the government is not just for governing but they need to provide the service for that we paid for. So you, when you go to this department, they have to release the information to be uh, released to public. They cannot uh, hide it. And another resource is the professional services. So when you buy a lot, you use agent, lawyer, architect, marketing, cannot everybody uh, you can reach. And uh, in the planning uh, phase, you have to use those because all the documents need to be finished by professionals. Mm -hmm. And then for when the planning is finished, all of the guys will leave and then only architect is still there. And then uh, the architect will help you to establish a new project team with structure engineer, mechanical, and electrical engineers, cost consultants, code consultants, elevator, environmental engineer, everything here. And then when the building permit is uh, uh, issued, you start construction. Most of those guys need to stay here to check the design, uh, to check the construction to comply with the Ontario building code and the design. So that's interesting is that only architect goes through all the process from beginning to, to, the, uh, to the end. So that's the reason the architect's firm can be uh, established with one person. But uh, once you have a larger project, you, you, have, you need uh, at least like uh, five, ten people. Otherwise, you cannot do work, do big work. So, and also for the service fee. In this part, the architect fee is about 50% uh, uh, of the whole service. And here, at least 25%, sometimes more, depending how complicated the project is. So th that's the reason for architect. That's something people always ask us. We don't uh, 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 describe our form. Uh, never described in this way. They always ask if your firm is the largest one, uh, not the Chinese uh, architect's firm. I say yes, but uh, we are a Canadian firm. In Chinese community, our firm is the largest one. And actually, even in the uh, non-Chinese community, our firm is, uh, is one of the largest one and uh, the design firm. So 80% of architect's firm is uh, we call the production a company, they don't do really uh, architectural, you know, innovative design. They do more like a focus uh, your functionality and the code requirements and finish the design and get the project done. Only 20% architects from really do some design. And then for a project, sometimes uh, you start here, the uh, first uh, uh, the condominium towns is started here, cannot finish the site plan approval. Why? Because of the design is not good and that uh, the urban designer in Scarborough sent it to Toronto uh, architecture review panel. You, if your design, the city staff is comfortable with that design, they don't need to do that. If you feel uncomfortable, they send to the uh, review panel. And then the review panel will review it and give you comments. And then they received 85 comments. And then the owner decided to change. And then when we 
we work on that, and uh, after a month, when we change the design and resend to the uh, city, they said that's okay. We will not send back to the review panel. So that's very important. And also for all other those uh, things, you have to hire a very qualified firm to do that. Don't think your project is very small. Hire one person uh, to do it, and then their document may not be recognized by the city. Not only because this person may not have experience, but because they may not have enough uh, information. And one of the uh, examples, we have a project that is a slope. We hired a guy. He's a very experienced one, but his firm is very small. And then he said that it's uh, uh, 14,000 donuts can finish the slope analysis. And uh, it sounds very reasonable. But uh, once they uh, finished the board, and then they cannot finish the report. And then I consulted with a larger firm. The larger firm said we can finish the report with uh, uh, 4,500. I said, uh, you are talking about the report. You haven't talking about the investigation. And he said that the whole area, we have all information done for the TRCA. Mm. So that means we use that information, write a letter to the TRCA, it will approve it, just like that. That's a, 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 a typical example. We, we had a lot of trouble with those things. But then you realize you need somebody who can provide the argument can be recognized by the authorities. So, and for this part, it's the same thing. So uh, I think you may uh, heard more story about the troubles during construction and building permit application. Uh, and then the design quality is very important. So uh, maybe, we, yeah, that is a process. I, uh, actually, I have already explained how to explain, uh, start a application and it could be appeared by yourself or by any other parties and get a, 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 a decision by the OMB. Now it's uh, not OMB. The process is the same. And, um, is it faster or slower without OMB? Uh, not only faster and slower. OMB is also slower. And one thing is uh, in Canada, once you run into legal process, there's no timelines. But the OMB was doing OK. But the, shin, the new uh, body, we don't know yet. You, uh, the, like a TLAP, Toronto um, local appeal body, uh, that body can deal with only the opinion of the decision made by the Committee of Adjustment. They are doing very well. They do much faster than OMB used to. But uh, for the another appeal, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So we can have a pause, and then, then we can come back to talk about the design and the construction and ma uh, management. Like uh, uh, 10 minutes, or? Yeah, if you have questions, we can stay here to uh, discuss. And uh, after a while, I can finish the second part. <laughs> Previous screen, you talked about percentage, 25%, 50%, yeah. whatever cost the application cost or for a project cost? Uh, application cost. <laughs> application cost. Yeah. Thank you. So architect's uh, service fee from beginning to end is about the construction cost uh, from 2% to 5%. It's a very big uh, difference uh, up to the uh, Complexity of the building, of the project. Mm -hmm. yeah. so the bigger the project, the smaller the percentage. Yeah. So one big way is, uh, uh, typically people calculate the cost is called, uh, the 100% uh, the is the construction cost or hard cost, only in the building construction as 1%. And then the soft cost uh, from 15% to 25%. That including design, service, application, and uh, approval, everything. 
So that is a way people are to calculate. Yeah. You have a business card. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you work in it. Go ahead. You will see that there's beyond dollar that. Uh, yeah. Now, Dr. John gave us what the information I love. For us, we are aging. We are only doing sales, purchase, right? So from time to time, we have a lot of investors, and you uh, sometimes custom build house for yourself as well. So in that case, of course, we cannot learn everything from one day or no, one month no. out. So what I can suggest, whatever you need to, uh, you have custom uh, investor or whatever you want to do, consult in specialist. He the specialist. Yeah. He can help us for do anything, right? Yeah, Plus, the, we are only doing the purchase and for the sales. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah, we are not intent to tell you everything by the seminar, but uh, uh, after the seminar, you know what issues could be for your project and who you can consult with. And then you can, uh, in first the thing you can do is can test test me the address. I can look at some planning requirements. And another thing you can do is go to the uh, city. They always have somebody in the front desk to answer your question. And only mark them. Uh, you cannot get the zoning bylaw information uh, at the uh, front desk. You can do it uh, online, and then they will email that to you in uh, uh, three to five bus uh, business day. And um, that, that is the thing. If you let us do, we also start in that way. But uh, many cities or towns have the information on their website. And even a smaller city sometimes doing better. You go to the website, you, uh, usually you say zoning information search and then zoning bylaw, and then usually go to the map first. In the map, they will say that is R3 something. And then you go to the, the text the bylaw and find out what R3 means and then you can find all the information. But the small town is better is you, you to go to there because there people are not so busy. When you wait in there, they will tell you everything and then it's better. Yeah, it's a good idea. <coughs> many is our agent, many prepared offers, especially for buying farmland. Last week, uh, two agents asked me what we can do, what the process we can do. So put your offer something in, in your offer and one condition, condition upon the buyer to verify the use, intended use yeah. with the township or with the city. Yeah. So you protect yourself first. Then later on, if you can go, you can go to the township, go to the city hall to ask for something regarding for the use, like let's say, let's say farmland or whatever. If you still feel difficult to do so, call Mr. Dr. Yeah. John, so yeah. he can help you out. And last week, also another agent talked to me regarding one industrial, uh, and I also came yeah. out of this as well. Yeah. The phase one, phase two started already done, and the, the, the purchaser can say, uh, feel some confused what they can do. And one of our agents as well, they, can all, they come to me at, again, the same yeah. property, They're much cheaper, 10,000 square foot is asking under $2 million. The supposed price will be 2.2 million. Yeah. So that means 200,000 less than the market price. In reality, is phase one, phase two study is gone, and the bank cannot finance the project. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, that uh, one that buyer said, I can spend my money 200,000 to do the to, cleanup. Yeah. But I said to the agent, if you can do the 200, spend 200,000. In the end, maybe 300,000. In the end. The, if the bank still cannot finance you the project, you yeah. waste your money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then yeah. that's not a good, good idea. So the yeah. only thing I would say, can solve the specialist. Yeah. She can help us. Yeah, yeah. So in this case, you can uh, forward your question to me, and uh, if I cannot answer, I will forward to people uh, we work the ways. Yeah. So the, yeah, that's very important. It is. Yeah. And uh, uh, generally, all the planning information is open to public at least once it is approved. That means if somebody apply for a new townhouse in like a Bayview before approved, you can 
check what have been submitted, they will not release the information. But once it's approved, they have to release the information to public. That's very good for us. That means uh, the information you can always find from the city. Uh, and also, yeah, once we went through this, you will understand when you hire somebody to do uh, your work, even you hire, uh, you can explain your clients, you hire an agent to buy a house, it's not necessary, or not only this agent is smart enough and experienced enough. Yes, Important is he has a resource behind him. Yeah. Like uh, David has any question, he can call me. Yeah. And uh, if I cannot answer, I can call others. And after all, we can figure out. That is the way why you, uh, you like to work with a company which is an established, experienced company. Like us, we did dozens of development projects, and we choose different consultants. They worked for us on the project we have done. Of course, they like to work with us for new projects. And how we can start new projects? We, uh, when you buy a land, we start being involved in and then we started the established relation with your clients and our potential clients. And then we know each other, we can move very smoothly uh, to the end. And the consultants also know, once, we, once he say we're by our land, that means a new project is coming up. But the first thing we need to help the clients buy a right land. If it's not good, and later we're going to have trouble and suffer with the clients for many years. And uh, yeah, don't know, uh, he, be hesitated to answer the questions to me, to David, to the city. And uh, one of the clients, they always ask me the question. And uh, one day they believe the, uh, a lot on Bayview is uh, sure c uh, can be converted to townhouse. But uh, when they firmed the uh, purchase and they called me, I said, guy, why didn't you ask me? <laughs> yeah, it should be, yeah. Because the whole area, is, the boundary is here, but only a four lot. Others is colored with blue, with green, only this one with gray. Oh, and then I say, we have, you have already purchased, we have to continue, we are still struggling on that. So when you put the offer in the condition, always you have to protect your client, yeah, protect yeah, yourself. Yeah. If you're not uh, clear about it, so put the condition there first. Yeah, first, so and then, then have some time. Right away, say, get the second opinion. Yeah, yeah. That's what yeah. happens. If it's once the offer is a firm, you're too late to back off from the deal. Yeah, yeah. So always protect yourself. And then Dr. John mentioned just now, you are not only the agent. See Chinese newspaper all the other words you see, Yi Tiao Long Fu, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that means you cannot do everything yourself. You yeah. have a team. You have a right? team to do everything. You have an architect, yeah. you have a lawyer, you have a accountant, you have everybody behind you. So yeah. that's your support. So yeah. Yeah. That's the service we needed, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, another uh, example, actually, is a very good example. They buy a lot. Uh, it's a last piece of a large development community. And then they give us the information. And the seller said, we really need so much information. That's it. We will not answer any question. We will not negotiate the price. Give me offer, we will sign. Uh, two weeks. And then I said, that's strange. We, we cannot finish it. And then we uh, sent to lawyers, sent to the, mechan and the uh, engineers, and they said, no problem. And the only one thing we don't know is uh, if they have already paid their share for the uh, infrastructure. And then, then we calculated that uh, it maybe cost like uh, 400,000. And then we, we did right, right, very right. We said uh, nobody in two weeks can know so much information. We know everything. And except that, the lawyer said only this agreement is still active. And then they said, okay, we drop 500,000 uh, price. And then if it happened, we will take it. And then when it's close, we go to the city. The city says that fee is already paid. <laughs> so oh, we're buying. And then we are lucky. And then when we apply for the uh, rezoning, 
Hey, we know there is a river there. The river has a, that small fish, it's a red side dish. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we know three, uh, 30 meters protection area. But when the guy writes the report, the, the river is here, and then the draw line is here. And then cut our lot, like uh, uh, 20%. And in this case, I said, that's, that's not acceptable. There's the river is here. And then that guy said to me, I can only use the map provided by the, uh, not the TRC, is the uh, Ministry of Environmental. And, uh, but uh, I know somebody can change it. And then we spend uh, 5000 uh, Donald hired a company. He knows where the river really is. We have the uh, topograph plan. We used to have only this side of the river. And then we spend another thousand for this part. And get that and get approved. And we finally move the river to where the river is. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, the, the clients are so happy. They said, uh, we are good. We, every step we are running very professionally. Even we had some trouble, we resolved it in a very professional way with very limited cost. So if you don't have this team, how you can do it? I, I, <laughs> yeah, I just uh, want to know, let's say we do have a conditional offer, how much would you charge for like a consultation fee? Uh, typically, once you give us the information, I will circulate with uh, our consultants. If they, everybody say no problem, we, we typically we don't charge. It. And then, but uh, one of them may say, no, you need to do a soil test. And then you need to go to that process. And then we will charge you time and that cost. And then oh, that is a, so over phone, so she won't charge. Yeah, we <laughs> want to charge. <laughs> you say, <"Look>, landmark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And then, but uh, some people on the market say, whenever you say that's a due diligence study, they will say, I will charge you 40,000 and 20,000 for me to check the things and then to go to the city and then talk to the counselor, maybe have a lunch uh, <laughs> with him or her. And another uh, 20,000 for the consultants, that's a typical thing I heard many times. But, uh, they may may not be able to do very well. Like uh, one of the cases, we uh, bought a uh, uh, client bought a uh, lot, and the city told them there is a flooding issue, and we are cut uh, one third of the lot. And uh, I ask a uh, uh, civil engineer. The civil engineer say, "No, that line is very old. I just finished the development on." Uh, upstream of that one. And I know the, how much water will be released from above to this area. The line can be uh, moved to somewhere here. And he did it. <laughs> so that's a very interesting thing uh, you can do. And in this case, the uh, uh, professional consultants are so important. And, uh, yeah. yeah. The garage is supposed to be on the right yeah. when you face into the house. Yeah. So now when the buyer goes to the site, they notice that the garage is on the left. <laughs> so if that is something is acceptable, it's allowed for the builder to do so, or the builder is not allowed? So no, you need to, that is a very strange question, but it happens in North York. One guy get a yeah. building permit, yeah. and then and then they changed the, the location of a garage without the approval by the city and then finish it and the city say, I will not approve uh, close uh, your construction. And then I don't know if you are In that case, yeah, so the that, own, that's exactly there, the house. I saw that. The yeah. only way you can do is yeah. go back to the city, say, it is as built. You, because the, the first thing, if it is compliant with the building code, and then you only deal with the city with the zoning bylaw. The zoning bylaw can be changed by the committee. And if the committee does not want to change, you can appear. So that's the way. But this is not closed but it's not yet. acceptable because. It's not, not closed yet. So right now, the buyer is like, because before it's closing, the 
required need to do, do the terrier inspection, whatever, needed to sign the document. So they noticed that, oh, no way, the garage, how come it's... <laughs> yeah. to the, the first thing you need the city yeah. to sign off the construction. So, you, so, can the, so the buyer can really accept it from the building? No, you cannot can accept it. If you accept it, that is illegal construction. You have to change the plan and resubmit to the city. Uh -huh. The city may need a review for building code and the zoning bylaw. If it is, does not comply with the zoning bylaw, you need to go to the committee get approval. When that is approved, a new revision to the building permit will be issued. And then they will do inspection and say, that's done. So and then you can sell or do whatever. So the builder needs to do that. Is a builder or the yeah. yeah? Because it's before, not a closer yet. Yeah, before closing, of course, yeah. the builder has to use everything. Right? Yeah, don't so try to close it for your clients. That's very dangerous. So, so it's it's when they so the builder definitely is going to contact the buyer for the closing. Mm -hmm. So the buyer can say no, that's not the house I yeah. bought originally. Yeah. I'm yeah. not going to sign the document. No, no. no. You, so you should. So the builder have to do something. The buyer, the, the, the buyer needs to get the legal document, permit or whatever from the builder. Otherwise, I won't close the deal. Yeah. Okay. That's easy. Don't look okay, close. So that's easy. Just a refer to sign. No. I need to see the legal document. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's we we the other with a very very complicated <laughs> project, uh, unsuccessfully. And uh, in downtown, it's a semi-detached house. One uh, of the uh, unit is attached to the rear yard without the building permit. And then the, the neighbor uh, told the city, and the city issued a stop working. And then we started the uh, variance application and the neighbor uh, opposed it and uh, refused. And then we appeared, they approved, and uh, okay, the zoning is done. And then we applied for building permit. They said, uh, okay, there is uh, two units, you need a fire protection, you need uh, uh, the, the pipe running in some way, we have done everything. And the last one is that uh, the war between the two units Need to be uh, built with uh, non-combustible uh, material, but it is built with wood, so we have nothing to do. And then all the work, the construction, the application, our service fees, the lawyer go to the uh, court for OMB for appeal, everything like a hundred thousand, and then remove to. Uh, the original